This week on the Sports Initiative podcast, I sit down with Ian Hughes, the Vice President of Player, Coach and Curriculum Development at Still Soccer. Formerly a coach educator for the Welsh FA, Ian discusses his role at Still Soccer and how he supports coaches around the US, the positive learning environment created by the Welsh FA and how they support and challenge candidates whilst on the course, as well as his scouting role for the Wales first team in the lead up to Euro 2016 and the World Cup qualifiers. I hope you enjoy. Right, Ian, first of all, thank you very much for um, jumping on. I guess, how are things stateside? How are you? Did you have a good Christmas break, etc.? Yeah, thanks for the invitation. Um, happy to be here uh, talking to yourself. It's quiet, really, you know, with everything going on. Um, it, can't, it couldn't have been anything but quiet. Uh, different states over here have different regulations about movement. So, um, yeah, it was a quiet one. I've not, I've not been home for two years now, so I was hoping to get home this Christmas, but that wasn't to be um but yeah it was a quiet christmas and new year and yeah getting back to it uh back in work this week perfect so obviously i came across you as you were there kind of social media and stuff and you've seen um, a lot of the good work you're doing kind of looked at your profile and then subsequently we've had conversations where we have to see and you've got a really extensive list i guess of the stuff that you've done with some really like amazing opportunities and experiences and stuff along the way so I appreciate it's quite extensive, um, but you just want to kind of roll through some of the stuff you've been in and where you are now and out of America and how you've got there. Yeah, well, uh, it is extensive. I'll try and keep it as short as I can. Um, well, it was, I was 14, actually, so I went on work experience and, that, and I still value the work experience model in the, in the UK. I went to work with uh, on work experience with Oshan Roberts, who was the football development officer on Anglesey at the time. Um, and after a week I just knew I needed to be involved in football in some regard you know ideally as a player but I was never good enough to become a player so from that early age of 14 I started working in soccer schools like most people do you know and learning my trade and craft I started doing qualifications uh, coaching qualifications from an early age too um, progressed um, became uh, part of the technical team with the Football Association of Wales um, and had numerous roles within that over a nine-year period. My, my final role with, with the organisation was a senior coach educator manager. So kind of overseeing the coach education pathway, uh, rewriting and supporting uh, the implementation of online learning, which is obviously something big at this moment in time, a hot topic with, uh, with COVID. And um, doing that from level one to level four, um, I was fortunate enough to do the UA for pro license at the age I think I was 29 I always had the target of doing the pro license before I was 30 um so I got on it uh, when I was 29 and culminantly with that I was also the um full time oh, sorry the first team manager of Aberystwyth Town who play in the Welsh Premier League so with senior team I'd been assistant manager there for the previous three years an opportunity arose spoke to a couple of people and took that on uh, at the age of 29 so I was managing um, you know, senior players in the, in the top domestic division in Wales at an early age too. So I've always kind of done things at an early age. And, you know, what I would say to people listening here, if you're a young coach, don't let that deter you. You know, when I went in at 29 years of age, the questions that were thrown at me was, oh, he's too young. What experience has he got? Well, my, my response to that was, well, I've been coaching since I was 14. It's 15 years later. If I was a professional player and I retired at 35, I'd be 50 now. So I'm getting on a little bit. So, you know, people have different timelines and I did that relatively early. Um, and then an opportunity arose for me to come over to the uh, United States. Um, and that kind of occurred kind of 2018. Uh, the two years prior to that, I started working part time as well. Um, as an opposition analysis scout for the Welsh FA. So we uh, best three years of my life in, in Paris uh, during the Euro 2016 campaign. Um, and then also I uh, was selected to be carry that carry on that role for the World Cup qualifying campaign and was able to go to 
countries like Moldova and Serbia and learn so much about different cultures and different people. And then that gave me the thirst to, you know, understand more about the world, really. And this opportunity came to come to America. And now I'm the, you know, the, the VP, the vice president. It's a typical American phrase um, of curriculum coach and player development for, for Steel United. And we've got uh, clubs all across the country. We've got uh, eight regions. So it allows me to travel, obviously, before COVID, to travel the country and see a little bit more of the world. So we'll probably go back to front. Um, so we'll go where you are now and then work our way kind of back from there. So I guess the first question is, how have you found being out there? Obviously, culturally very different to the UK. I guess the, the profile of the sport in particular is kind of increasingly growing, increasingly trying to increase. Um, so how have you found the differences? And has there any been any challenges that you maybe wouldn't have expected when you first arrived over there? Yeah, I mean, I, I did obviously my research before coming over. <clears throat> I mean, the one interesting thing is, you know, the American lifestyle and sports, soccer, um, isn't high on the agenda. However, I think it is growing. Um, and I think one reason for that um, is in the NFL, at this moment in time, you've probably read a lot about concussion, you know, <clears throat> and um, things happening with American football. And I think soccer has benefited from that in terms of the number of players playing soccer now compared to American football. Now, the interesting thing is now with dementia being a big topic in the UK, whether that will revert, you know, players aren't allowed to head the ball up to the age of 12 in America anyway. But that was that's an interesting um, dynamic with other sports and, you know, the rising uh, popularity of soccer based on, of course, the, the, the game, but also, you know, some other elements within other sports in America that are slightly fractured and parents are making a decision that it's probably safer and better for them to play soccer than maybe some other sports. So that's an interesting dynamic um, that we've come across, that I came across since arriving. And in terms of different areas, as you said, you, you've got, was it eight clubs across the state? Where are those based? And guess, have you seen any differences from state to state or place to place? Yeah, so we're over in eight regions. So we're on the east and the west coast. So on the west coast, we're in um, California, <clears throat> Washington and um, Texas. And then on the east coast, we are in Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, uh, Philadelphia um, and Virginia. So we've just started up in Virginia as well. So um, every region has differences. So when we talk about putting a curriculum together uh, and the cultures, it, 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 it's sometimes difficult. However, you know, we truly believe in having a standardized curriculum with individuality. And what we mean by that is if every session was a national curriculum session, <clears throat> we would be doing the players a disservice because we wouldn't be concentrating on the need of that particular player and team at that particular time. So what we do, we, we kind of mix both together. <clears throat> the first session of the week across the country, every um, steel player will do the same session. Based on different age groups, of course, we'll do different types of sessions, but they'll do a similar session based on our game model. So it's standardized. And then the second or and third session of the week are based on the need of the players and the teams at that particular time. So the danger, of course, of just doing that is that nothing's standardised. And, and the danger with having everything standardised is that there's no individuality within the curriculum. So we've, we've put a programme together to make sure that we have both. Um, and then currently with COVID <laughs> over in California, they're only able to have um, COVID-based safe distance sessions. And over in other regions, such as New, Jer New Jersey and Massachusetts, all they have to do is wear a mask, but they can they play you know scrimmages and tournaments. So again, we need to we have to alternate and look at a new curriculum based on safe distance, which we've managed to do. So some of our regions are now currently following slightly different curriculums, but hopefully when when you know we come out come out of this, we'll go back to the original national curriculum and, and individuality within it. Um. So yeah, in terms of like creating the curriculum what was the actual process for you to go down what what were the key principles that you look for yeah it was interesting when i came over every team in the club played four two three one um 
And of course, listen, that there are benefits to having a formation based curriculum and, and, and the principle being around the formation, you know, simplicity being one of them. Um, however, at Steel, our ethos is kids first. And I just thought and we thought, well, you know, if we're making players fit into a particular formation, are we putting the formation first or are we putting the players first? So we, we've changed two years ago when I came in, we, we changed completely. We moved away from a formation-based uh, curriculum to a principles of play-based curriculum. And this is something I, I learned when I was working at the Football Association of Wales. So we've got a game model that has specific principles. And regardless of the formation, all of our players have to play the same style. So for example, one principle might be overloading midfield, okay, having more players in midfield than the other team. But back in Wales, we had the first team playing with a box in midfield. So they had four players in there already, usually playing against three. So the overload was automatically in place. Then the under-19s might play 4-2-3-1, which means there's a three versus three potentially in midfield if the other team play with a three in there, which means our central defender or our winger or someone has to move into that central area to create the fourth player. So the, the idea. And, and the principle was creating midfield overloads, right? How you get there is different based on the formation you play. So that was the first thing we put together. The second thing we felt was if we have, for example, two very good number nines, two very good strikers, and we play 4-2-3-1 in a certain team, well, one of them's sitting out for 50% of the game or one of them's having to play out of position. So again, that didn't really make much sense by adhering to the 4-2-3-1 formation. And then finally, you know, a lot of our players have ambitions to go and play in the college game. So we can't determine what formation those college coaches are going to play with our players. So we need to develop the holistic player. So for example, in our 2002 team in Massachusetts at the moment, we've got an extremely good central defender. That central defender has had experience playing in a back four and a back three. Because our concern is if you went to a college and the college coach decided in six months' time he wants to revert from a back four to a back three, and our player hasn't played in a back three before and he's sitting on the bench because of that, that's my fault. That's our fault. As, as a club and as, as, you know, as coaches, we've let that player down. So that's why we move from a, four to a formation based uh, approach to a principle of play based approach. But that doesn't mean, you know, coaches and, and teams do what they like. There's still a style of play that they have to adhere to. And the curriculum is all based on, you know, our game model and our uh, t uh, personal individual attainment targets, too. So, what would um, I appreciate they'll have different formations, different profiles and stuff. But what would the standardised things be? What would be the, if we were to come and watch a team in California or Massachusetts, what would be the game-based principles that we would see on, well, hopefully see on show? <laughs> yeah, we hope. Um, so, so, so we break the, 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 the game model into four. So, you know, the four facets of a game, in possession, out of possession, attacking transition and defensive transition. So they're the four things we look at, and that's the terminology we use. So in possession, we're looking for, for players to break lines. And, and these are all words and buzzwords that I'm sure everyone's heard about. Um, uh, so breaking lines would be one. Switch and play would be another one. Um, final third play, being creative and around the box, would be one as well. So, you know, I've seen some game models that say playing out from the back. We haven't put that in because it might not be the best option to play out from the back occasionally. So we recommend and we suggest and we educate our players and our coaches to play out from the back. However, if we put it in our game model, they have to every time. Ultimately, we're asking players to make wrong decisions. So again, it has to be a player decision based um, approach as well. So that will just be in possession, be them kind of things and they sound like fluffy words and they are until we introduce them into the curriculum and make sure our players you know are working on certain elements of the game you know and then of course out of possession without going through the more will be narrow compact force into wide areas we don't want anything coming down the middle of the field which is obviously the quickest way to go 
So that they're just simple, you know, concepts that are delivered within our curriculum that we expect to see on the field. I think it's interesting the point you made there regarding the constantly playing after the bat. Um, you look at uh, Man City, for example, who have been a great exponent the last few years of that under Pep. And um, I know there's clips going around the English FA of Edison at points just skipping everyone out and just having Sterling in a 1v1. Um, and I, I think that, you know, people begin to realise actually, if you can do that effectively, that is probably the best pass in football. If you can go from back to front with quality and you put your player for on goal, that's a good quality pass. I remember seeing Aguero score a goal and it was Edison. I don't know if it's on the same clip. This was a couple of years ago. And Edison played it into Aguero. Aguero was in a one versus one. I think the other team had gone man for man against Manchester City. And Aguero went and scored. And it's the most... It's, it's the most... Um, I've seen Guardiola celebrate. And that was really interesting to me because that told me that you know, Edison's made the right decision, but also that's a message to the league. You come and press us high up the field, we'll just go and do that, you know. So, again, it puts a doubt in the opposition's mind. Now, if I was playing against Guardiola in the next game, it'd be, OK, well, if we press, we know that one's going to happen. So what's the best thing to do? It might be to drop. And then once they drop, then Guardiola can play his style of play and play out from the back. So, yeah, it was interesting to see Guardiola's reaction on the side when that goal went. I've never seen him so uh, so happy. And, you know, I assume it's because that was a message to the league. Come and press us, but we'll just play play beyond and we got the players to do that. So, that yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a really good point. Sometimes that is the best pass. And then, you know, ultimately you're trying to find space. So it's, if switching from one side to the other, be it to drag them to press you to then go longer or be it to play out to then be able to go through and behind or whatever that is. Um, I think that's essentially you're trying to find space and exploit the space. It doesn't matter how, how that happens. And and yeah, and there's two things there. It's about finding the spare player is big for us. So we talk to our players about who's our spare player, you know. And when in the first five minutes of our games, our coaches will ask the players on the field the question, you know, who's our spare player? Usually it's a central defender if they play with a one, one forward. Um, but that'll change. You know, if they play with two forwards, it might be our number six, our holding midfielder, if they play in 4 4 2. So we ask a lot of questions of our players for them to start thinking about the game. And then once we know who our spare player is, ultimately, then hopefully we can get a hold of the ball and we can dominate possession better than what we would if we didn't know who our spare player was. And then there's all, always space on the field. You're quite right. So if a team presses high, the space is in behind. If the team drops off, the space is in front. So again, these are all questions we ask our players to make decisions on, on the field. We don't always give them the answers because yes, we can give them the answers and the performance in that game can, can be better. But ultimately for you know everlasting learning, it's about the players identifying themselves. So asking questions is key uh, around those subjects. So I guess I've got two questions off the back of this. And the first one is, obviously, for you to make this change, you're giving quite a lot of ownership to the, the coaches in terms of them implementing this style of play, but also having good knowledge of their groups to understand what formation might fit those people or might challenge those players best. So one, how do you support that? And then I guess a second in back kind of linking into it is, what curriculum was designed to help them? So from a weekly, monthly, micro, macro level, what was put in place to support them to say, well, these are the areas you need to work on. Do you revisit things bi-weekly or how does that look? Yeah, so um, so we have technical directors um, in each region that we work with. So, you know, when, when coaches are determining what formation they need to play, <clears throat> There has to be a discussion with the technical director and the technical director is obviously the expert of the region. So that, so you know, our coaches can't just go and determine a formation and just play it. There's a, there's a discussion, you know, and around, okay, well, you want to play that way, why? You know, and there's just justification. And as long as our coaches can justify why they want to play a certain formation, that's okay. But what you kind of find a lot of times is you speak to people and they're not sure about a certain thing and that's when it's our job to support them come to, to a decision on that. So, yeah, so there's a discussion that goes on. Um, and then also what we don't want, of course, is coaches changing formation every week. 
because that can be detrimental it's de- detrimental too. So it's understanding, you know, you're going to play 4-4-2 diamond this week, 4-3-3 next week, 4-4-2. Like, no, that doesn't work either. You know, you've got to understand what system and what formation you're going to play and you're going to work on it, you know, in training and practice for a significant amount of time. Because if you just move from one to the other, it just becomes confusing to the players and that's the last thing we want. So there's always a discussion with our technical director. And then what we do is we have quite an extensive coach development program within, um, within the club. So I'll run, I visit each region um, two or three times a year and support coaches and technical directors. We have virtual meetings around and presentations, which I deliver <clears throat> around supporting the, the development of players and, and, and the style and formation. Um, and then we also have on-field observations where our coaches will be seen between two to four times a year. Um, and that will be from the planning stage where the coaches will plan their session and, and talk to the coach developer to the delivery. So a coach developer will go out uh, and observe sessions and then written feedback at the end. And we don't give feedbacks uh, live after the session because our coaches will ref- have to reflect the complete reflection form. So if we give, so if you come off the field, Michael, and I give you direct feedback, that's going to influence your reflection. We don't want that. We actually want to know what you thought about that session. So um, what what happens after the session is you'll complete that within 48 hours and then you will get your written feedback within 48 hours of completing that that reflection. So that's how it works. And you'll receive a phone call, a Zoom meeting uh, about, you know, closing the loop, next steps, your development, what you need to do. I think sometimes we, we write down and we tell coaches what they need to develop but we don't actually support them to develop that that part of their coaching um, practice. So what we do then is we form and we have um, practical training evenings in all regions. And what's delivered is based on the feedback to the coaches. So Michael, if you need to improve your organizational skills, there'll be an element in, in the training where you will go with coaches of similar ilk and you'll go and work on that aspect, you know, and you'll see someone do that. So, yeah, that's how we kind of do it. I mean, now we're piloting, actually, uh, giving live feedback during the session. So we're going to, with technology, it's an opportunity for them to wear the, you know, the the earpieces. And um, our coach developers are able to give feedback live during the session. And there's some education around that, of course, you know, and it could be a simple, nothing tactical, but it could be something as simple as, Hey, Michael, think, you've obs- think of your observational position. Are you happy that you can see everything on the field? Are you missing things behind you? Just something as simple as that. And then you can have a look around and you can determine if you feel you are or you're not. You know, So, yeah, we support our coaches, I think, um, significantly. And, and you're right, it's a challenge. But, you know, for putting kids first, it's something that we certainly need to do. Perfect. And then in regards to the curriculum stuff, yeah so curriculum so again the biggest thing in terms of the curriculum is we use sports session planner like a lot of um a lot of other organizations so we you know that gets sent out every um every week it's a week to uh, to the regions and then the biggest thing i think that we support our coaches the most is the planning aspect and that's i think one at times that can be put to the side and forgotten about but for my, you know, working with the Football Association of Wales, and it's it's obvious to me that if you get the planning right, you can concentrate on the coaching and you can coach the players based on, you know, the principle you work in that night, whether it's switching play, whether it's counter-attacking, whatever it may be, you can concentrate on the actual coaching. You get the planning, not, not great. You're not coaching that evening. You're changing area sizes. You're doing everything else other than coaching. So, you know, the extra 10, 20 minutes of planning a session, I think is fundamental to the success of the session. Lenny Lawrence, I know a lot of you will know Lenny. Lenny, you know, had over a thousand games as manager in the English system. Spent 45 minutes discussing whether he was going to move a goal two yards on a field. So that tells you the level of detail and depth that these managers and top coaches are going to you know, to get the planning right. Another story, Roberto Martinez came through the system with us when he was at Wigan. 
he would spend, he says, six hours planning the session for the next day because he needed to make sure every player in that session got something out of it that was relevant to them. Listen, we don't all live in the world where we can spend six hours to plan a session, but what it does do, it does give you an insight into the importance of planning that, you know, these top people uh, um, are seeing. And I assume, obviously, this links in quite nicely into your coach development work. Um, it seems like there's a little bit of crossover in terms of what you're doing now to, to what you did then. Um, how much has the work you did with the Welsh FA um, kind of informed your your thinking moving into this world? Yeah, it has massively. You know, I, I, <clears throat> I was, as part of my role, I used to travel around the country, you know, Manchester City one day working with a coach, Leeds the next day. You know, and I got to understand different philosophies, different mod mod models, you know, and I think I took that for granted slightly since coming over here. But so that certainly has. And then working with people like Ian Mitchell, who's now uh, one of the top psychologists with the English FA, working with the first team, Oshan Roberts, of course, uh, Carl Darlington, Dr. Dave Ad uh, David Adams. <clears throat> so all of them have had an influence on me. And I think what the Welsh FA did well was they gave us the staff, the training we needed. So they brought an Ian, Mitchell, uh, Ian Mitchell in to speak to us around mentoring, you know, and how to support and the language that you use, you know. So, you know, understanding that it's our job to facilitate. That's it. It's facilitate and support the learning of coaches. Never to impress on a coach. It's not our ideas that's important. You know, the important people in the, in the, in the process is, is the coach. You know, and I think that's really important. Sometimes as young coach developers, we want to try and show our knowledge. Oh, why don't you do it this way? We should never say that. I mean, we should never say actually also that something will never work. If I was mentoring you, Michael, and you show me your plan, it would be my responsibility to raise concerns. So, yeah, I've got, you know, Michael, you're t saying about the number 10, pressing the other central defender on the switch. My only concern would be the distance that player has to travel in the time it's going to take for that ball to arrive. It may work for you. I'm not sure, but it'd be interesting to see. Ultimately, you know, I'm not telling you to change it. All I'm saying is there's a concern there. You go and do the session. And then afterwards, we're having the conversation. I'm hey, Michael, that was great. That was really good. That worked for you. That number 10 was able to get there at that time. So, you know, that worked. And I've learned off you as well. It's a two-way process sometimes. Or it might be, hey, Michael, so we raised those concerns beforehand, didn't we? And on the switch, the team got out six times in 20 minutes. And then it's discussing why that may be the case, you know? So facilitation and, you know, asking the right questions is so, so important. And it's something I'm grateful for going through the process with the Welsh FA to make sure that, you know, it's my responsibility to support the development of coaches. That's a massive responsibility, you know. I think parents who allow us to develop their players and give us the responsibility and trust to develop their players, there's no bigger responsibility you can give a coach from a parent, you know. And I think it's the same. That's the way I see our coaches it's my responsibility to support them, and I take that seriously. And I'm not just saying this because I'm on the call to you. Yeah. Everything I've heard about the Welsh FA and the way that they deliver their courses has been overwhelmingly positive um, in terms of people's experiences, the support they had and whatnot. So what, what was it about the environment that you're able to create or the people that you had in place or the course design that makes everyone coming away speaking so highly of their experience going through that process? Well, I, th I think, you know, we don't want robots uh, is the first thing. We don't want everyone to be coaching the same way. Everyone's going to have a different philosophy and understanding of the game. So we don't want to say this is the way to play. This is how you have to do things. It's not about that. It's about developing and supporting you, the coach, to develop your own style, your own philosophy. Of course, you know, if you go for an exam and unfortunately you're on a press from the front and the other team get out six times, like I said earlier, and you don't deal with it, then it's difficult, you know, for someone to pass that course. But, you know, it's supporting the, the coach through the process and making sure that, yes, we can't guarantee everyone's going to pass the course. But what we can guarantee is that you're going to be a better coach at the end of the course. You know, that's the biggest thing and supporting those those candidates through it, you know, and building those relationships constantly on a weekly basis, speaking to the 
to the coaches, any questions that you have, not only supporting them on the field, but with the coursework as well. That's really important, you know. Um, and I was fortunate. Listen, I've come through the process and the system myself. So um, I might be talking bias, biased here, but, you know, the amount of different people that I learned off was incredible. You know, I learned off the coach, you know, that coach is in the, in the town next to me. I've also learned off people like Patrick Vieira, you know, and Thierry Henry. So, you, you know, it, 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 the wealth of information that you get in from an informal perspective, you know, formal is so, so important. The formal courses that the Welsh FA and every other federation run are important. But I come to the conclusion that your informal learning is as important, if not more important. So I'll give you an example. I presented last year to a group of 20 to 24 coaches. And I asked them, I said, think about your current coaching practice and put down on paper on, on the note, on your note, how much of a percentage was learned informally and how much was learned formally. For, uh, formally. And do you know what? On average, I'm going to say to you, 70 to 75% was the number that they put down that part of their coaching practice, 75% of it was learned informally. So that tells me whatever we do with our courses and our informal, you know, learning on courses is really, really important. But the informal stuff, the blogs that you read, the coaches that you go and observe, you know, that, they're the things that are going to make you a special coach. You know, yes, the, the fundamentals you're going to learn on the courses with the Welsh FA, but it's the informal learning that the coaches are willing to do outside of the formal setting is really what's going to, really what's going to develop you quickly as a coach. So how do you create the environment where, I mean, it must be really easy if you're sitting there with Pat Rivera next to you and the tutor is asking a question, everyone just turn around and look and go, do you want to answer? Because <laughs> So how, how do you go about asking them for their experiences, which not a lot of people have had, but then also challenging them at points to say, well, actually, no, I wouldn't, I don't think that's right, or I wouldn't do that. How, how would you go about creating that situation? Well, the, the culture's created from the first moment someone steps through the door. <clears throat> and, um, and Dragon Park, if you've been down to Dragon Park, is, you know, it's, it's Wales' it's St. George's Park, if you like. Um, and I remember, you know, one uh, coach standing up, World Cup winner standing up, before the B intensive and saying, hey, I've done a lot in the game, okay, I've played, but I'm going to learn off each and every one of you in this room over the next few days. You guys have got a lot more experience than I have about coaching, you know. And what you find is the, the top level coaches and the players and the ones that have performed the best in their careers are the most humble. You know, they want to listen and they want to learn. And I think that's really important to get the balance right. And you've got to remember, players have a degree in the game. They've played it day in, day out, and worked in the top managers. What a lot of times, sometimes what, what they need to su support in is the communication. How do they get the message across to the players, the organisation, the planning, something they've never done before. Um, they've got the knowledge a lot of the time. Not every time, but a lot of the time what you see with these top players is they've got the knowledge because of their you know, the, the degree that they've got in football of playing it every day for the last 10 to 15 years. What they need to support then is on organisation, planning, interventions, how long they're in for, you know. So there's so much to learn still. And I'm going to say to you that, you know, 95% of the, you know, top professionals that I've seen come through the pathway are willing to, you know, want to listen and want to learn, which I think is really important. Uh -huh. I assume it links a little bit to what you said at the start, which is, you know, if you started coaching at 14 um, and, you know, 15 years later, you're 30, that's 15 years of coaching. So whilst you might not have the experiences of uh, playing at a very, very top level, what you do have is loads of interactions with people and loads of examples of how to deal with individuals who are struggling with this or, you know, experiences of dealing against this type of formation or how to deal with these players that are having conflicts, you've got experience of that. Whereas as a top end player, you might not have had to deal with any of that before. So I guess it's just reframing those experiences that you've had that could benefit them in a management point of view. 
Yeah, hundred percent. I remember when I, I did the A license. I was on the course, and I think I was twenty four in Aberystwyth, and um, Roberto Martinez was on the course. And I just come back from Barcelona on a study visit, and I went to watch Laurent, uh, Barcelona play Villarreal. Lorente was playing for Villarreal as the number nine. And I just happened to mention it, and Roberto Martinez. Yeah, he's good. What, what are your thoughts on him? What do you think? And it was the first time, you know, like okay, well, I met him. He's asking Roberto Martinez, asking me. I'm twenty four. You know, he's asking my thoughts on the player. And then that told me that, you know, again, the top people, is, there's a two-way interaction. And, and you're right, you know, so you can always learn something off someone. So, you know, I've learned so much off, you know, a number of people within the game. And I'd like to think that, like you said, they've learned a couple of things off me, you know. So, and, and, and I think that's the important thing. And then the other thing from the Welsh FA perspective is they encourage you to be on the ground doing it. What we don't want to be as coach developers and mentors sitting, you know, in our house telling people what to do. We need to be going out and getting the experiences too. So, you know, working at, with youth players at Wrexham Football Club, working as a senior manager at Aberystwyth with Town, you know, I was getting those experiences and learning too. So it wasn't a case of, you know, I'm a coach developer and I, but I don't really practice what I preach. You know, I, we, we were doing that. A lot of us were doing that day, not day to day, but week to week with our, with our clubs as well. So I think that was an integration. I think that helped us as coach developers understand that, you know, what works in, in, in the modern day, I suppose. And I assume it's also, it allows you to try things that maybe have been brought up. So like you alluded to there in a session, if you'll say, if someone comes to you and says, oh, I've got this idea about how the 10 can press and keep them one way, and you're not sure about it, you could almost both go, okay, well, let's both go and deliver it and then we can reconvene about how we got on with it. It allows you to, in a practical setting, maybe challenge yourself with some of the ideas you might not instantly warm towards um, and then see how it actually works in practice. Yeah, 100%. The amount I've learned in those situations, going to watch A-licensed sessions, you know, pressing from the front. I'll give you an example. Cardiff City, went to Cardiff City uh, earlier. Cardiff City pressing from the front. And I wasn't sure, and, I, and it was brilliant. It worked really well. You know, because of the starting positions of the players. And then I went and I used that Faber Rustwith uh, a couple of weeks later. So again, we're all thieves in the game and then the no apologies for that. You know, the other thing that supported that as well was when I went out to start scouting games um, for the Welsh FA. So I was able to watch, you know, top teams, top players play. And, you know, you would be amiss if you didn't learn off that, of those situations and bring things back. Um, to your own kind of practice you know and things that didn't work and things that did so yeah and that, again I come back to that will probably be informal learning going to watch a game right or speaking to someone and seeing a session that would be real good informal learning that I can then attribute back into my own practice. So in terms of informal learning and I've likened to this on some of my experiences some of the best little nuggets or best sessions I've had is when you're having a beer at the end of the day, you're all knackered, yeah. but someone brings something up. Like the example I use is about the London cage culture, um, which I wasn't particularly aware of, but then a couple of lads really explained to me what that was. And amazing, brilliant, brilliant concept, brilliant for producing players. Is there any informal learnings you had from either people in those core um, courses or the senior pros that have come down that really stood out to you and thought that's really simple but great or a real example of where you've just kind of been blown away by something that someone said? Um, yeah, I mean, listen, every, every course really, you, you pick something up. In terms of the informal learning, I'll go back, for example, to, to this. So Wales qualified for the Euros and uh, some of us started to go out to watch games. So I was, I'm an Everton fan. So the first game I was asked to go and watch was Everton against Spurs. Ronald Koeman's first game. Brilliant. Yeah, of course I will. But whatever game we watched, we would try and implement it into our coach education on our A licence. You know, and so going away to watch these games, you know, you learn Liverpool's press. The first time I saw Liverpool's press and the clock was when I went to watch Liverpool play against West Brom. But then you see how they do it and how the midfielders get out and deal with the fullbacks and, and those are the things that you learn, um, you know, and I can't encourage. And that's something in America, I don't think players do enough. They don't watch the game. They don't learn enough, you know, compared to back in the UK, you know, yourself, all your players at Southampton are probably watching match of the day, watching the games, you know. So pl players as well as coaches can learn so much by, you know, observing games and picking things out. 
I think that it's something, particularly with the attention span of this generation where everything's quick, 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 or done. I, think I saw something uh, in an interview, someone said Netflix suggests you okay. put your best jokes in the first half an hour because they reckon that after 26 minutes, people often turn off, or that's the average time someone watches for, so you need to keep okay. them engaged for that bit, which it then might explain why people maybe don't watch 90 minutes of football because they, they get bored, but obviously you'd hope that they would. Um, what other experiences did you have doing that? Because I imagine you, you travelled up and down the country and saw different players working in different environments. Was there anything else that particularly stood you as you were travelling around? Um, yeah, Crystal Palace was good. So Crystal Palace, I worked with uh, Scott Gayat, who's the sport, first team sports scientist down in uh, Crystal Palace. So, um, you know, he was doing his coaching badges and the setup there that, you know, you went in and there were, there were things on the wall, you know, all things that inspire um, the players. So, you know, that was really interesting. And then, you know, I do like the way that, you know, periodization is massive now, of course, and how different teams periodize the, the physical, the tactical within their practices. You know, and I think in America, we don't do that enough. You know, in America, we've got, you know, physical trainers and you go to the gym to develop your strength, for example, or your football fitness. Whereas in the UK, that's all integrated on the field. So I still think there's a little bit of a way to go over here in terms of coaches understanding. No, no, if you adjust your area sizes and the times that you do certain tactical drills, it's going to get out certain fitness components that the players need. So they don't necessarily have to do everything fitness-wise off the field. So I saw Scott Gaillet in Crystal Palace integrate the sports science into the into practices really well. And that's kind of stood out for me in making sure that, you know, Scott Gaillet is a sports scientist, but he's on the pro license at this moment in time and he's a UEFA A license coach, you know. And again, uh, Ian Mitchell. Ian Mitchell's a UEFA A license coach. He's a psychologist, but he's a coach, you know, first and foremost with the, with the Welsh uh, in the 16s, he was on the field coaching the players. So, you know, it's 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 really interesting to me that the sports scientist isn't pushed away to the side, you know, and, and the psychologist isn't. They're becoming coaches now, and they're on the field delivering and leading football-based sessions that get out psychology or get out the sports science that they need. So uh, that's an interesting concept for me, and it's going to become more and more, I think, as, as we move forward, that, being a coach now, it's not enough. You know, being a coach, what's your expert? What's your expertise at being a coach? Chris Davis, the assistant manager at Leicester City, to Brendan Rodgers, was a first team opposition analysis um, when he worked at Swansea. Now he's the assistant manager and coaching day to day with Brendan on the field. So again, it's now being a coach isn't good enough. You've got to have that extra little bit. What makes you employable? Well, he's a He's a football coach with a sports science background. He's a football coach with an analysis background. He's a football coach with a psychology background, you know. So th those extra elements, I think, are so, so important for, for, for the future generations of coaches coming into the game. I also think um, it's interesting how things are being broken down. So the common one is Liverpool with the throw-in coach who came in and did work with them on that. And kind of America's to a degree and other sports is leading the way for that. You look at American football coaches, they have probably more coaches than they do players, but it does allow you to really take care of your, your section or really kind of go in depth into those knowledge. So then when you get the bigger roles, the leading or anything, you've got, I can do all this, but I've got specialization of X, Y, Z, or I've got a background in this stuff when I worked at this college or whatnot. Like now, you know, I can deal with the top stuff as well, which I think is really interesting. In terms of the process for you being an opposition scout, what did that look like? What would that look like from maybe the days before leading up to the game and then the report afterwards? Yeah, so when we were uh, for the Euros, I think there was eight of us out there. Um, and we would, before the game, so we'd have a document that we needed to submit to Martin Hodge. Martin Hodge was our um, chief scout and still is the chief scout uh, for, the, for the Welsh FA. He also um, had a recruitment at Burnley at this moment in time. And uh, so the first thing before any of that, we had training down in Cardiff. So he came in and the analysis, 
team came in and we had training on the document and what we wanted to see and what they what information they really needed um, and then we got the document and we would compl- we'd fill the first part out so the squad lists you know height weight we'd have all that information in there and we would go as in depth as what 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 the weather was like that day of the game who was the referee you know so how many yellow cards were given out so then you get an understanding of not only of the team you're going to play against you might not play that team but you might have the referee in the next game so there's information on those kind of things as well uh, the weather would be another thing like i mentioned then you would go to a game so it may be two of us it may be one of us based on the teams that we needed to, to see play um, we would observe the games, we would make our notes. I would personally make my notes on a notepad. Some would use their phone, some would use dictaphone. You know, people work in different ways and, you know, it's got to be right for them. Uh, by the time we got back to the hotel, the analysis department over in Wales would have sent us the game. So we had the game to watch um, and we'd have minutes written down, of course. Uh, then we would spend the next day, probably about seven or eight hours, breaking down the footage, making sure that the, you know, the document was right it was in possession out of possession attacking transition defensive transition and set pieces so we'd look at all that we'd look at any changes in formation within the game we would look at you know any substitutions within the game and then we would even you know give a rationale behind the substitution so for example if a team are two nil up with 15 minutes to go and their best player goes off the likelihood is he's being rested for the next game if it's one one with 10 minutes to go and the team needs to win and the best player goes off, well, the assumption may be that he may be carrying an injury. You know, So you would assume certain things as well when you saw it. And you would spend, yeah, hours completing that and sending that to Martin Hodge. Then what Martin Hodge would do as the chief scout, he would collate all the information and whoever Wales were playing next in the next game, he would put that into a presentation and deliver that to Chris Coleman, Oshan Robertson and, and the staff. And so how did it change, um, I guess, from, from when, when you're going to look at an opposition to then go and look at an individual? Yeah, and, and in, the, it was, in the individual, it was interesting. So with the individual, it was starting the warm-up. So we'd get there before the warm-up, you know, and I won't mention names, but I went to watch a player and all, the, all his teammates went in to the changing room before the game and this player stayed out until he scored a goal. He couldn't go. He couldn't go in. He had to stay out and practice and shooting towards the end of the warm up. He had to stay out, which was really interesting to me that he wasn't willing to go in with it. That he had to, you know, his mind said he had to score this goal, and then he did. Then he went in. So it starts from the warm up. Um, then you're looking at how the player is able to play in certain formations. So you know, going back to Ashley Williams, has played in a three, played in a four. You know, the type of players are playing next to him. So does he have a quick player play next to him or, or, a, or a slower player play next to him, which may influence what he does? So you take, you know, the, the, the units around him and the players around him, which, you know, could base a reason why, you know, that player's playing a certain way. Then you're looking at, yeah, the tactical, technical, physical, uh, you know, psychological. So is he having a go at his teammates when they lose the ball? Is he having a go at the referee? What's he like when he's substituted? does he throw a bottle on the floor or you know so all those things are taken into account and, and written up and sent in and they kept you know on all the players and it's not just the first team players we do you know I know the Welsh FA do this with all players in their intermediate squads you know all the way down to their under 16s that you know that they, they, they collate all the reports because you know we want to know everything about the player you know so um, that was really interesting and whether the players play two caps or a hundred caps it doesn't matter that they'll still go through the same process and get seen. So, yeah, it is slightly different because obviously you're looking at that one player, um, but it's about how that one player plays within the team too. I think that's really important. And did that um, inform your coaching or your management when you were honing in on that one individual? Did you ever... Did you, were you ever able to like transfer those lessons into when you were working with teams at a weekend? Yeah, occasionally. I mean, you know, when I was manager of Aberystwyth, we um, we had a player, isn't it? Chris Venables, his name. Some of you may have heard about him. Um, very well known in the Welsh game, and he was a midfielder. He was a box to box midfielder, and um, we reverted him to a number ten, and. The next three seasons, he he won 
he was top top scorer of the league for those three seasons. I think he won two uh, Player of the Season awards as well. And it was based on he wasn't your natural number ten. He wasn't like a Coutinho where that would drop a shoulder and beat a player. He was one that would get in the box and score back post, back post, back post, back post goals. You know, and he would run and he would run, and in the end, whoever he was playing against would tire and he'd get in and he'd score. And th- those were kind of things that I saw. So I went to watch crew play at Oldham, I think. Um, and uh, there was a couple of players playing then. Um, and yeah, it was just looking at, I can't remember the name of the player now, but looking at the player and his movement, he was the same build as, as, as Chris Venables was. And he was able, you know, physically to get into the box. And that was one reason, because we were a team that crossed the ball quite a lot in any case, to create wide overloads, our full backs would go, our wingers would come in, etc. And um, and it worked for us. And I picked that up actually from going to watch watch a game and seeing how how Oldham played against Crew, which was interesting. And then when when you're doing these reports, are they always to, sorry going back to the team? And when you're doing these reports, are, are they always going back to um, what we can do to counteract it in mind, or is it just I'm going to put this report in from an impartial? unbiased situation and then the information what's done with that is down to the coaches yeah no so it was slightly different so in in the euros because the turnaround was so short between games we were told that if we did have any ideas as well just to note them down there's there's no harm in putting some notes down if you feel that a way of exploiting that could be a b or c like and that that was okay and we so that was and that was just based on the quick turnaround the games because like you were playing you know, last 16 one day and then like literally three or four days later, you were playing the quarterfinals. So, um, you, you know, you're encouraged to put down. And again, that comes from from above, you know, Washington Roberts and, and, and Martin Hodge in terms of what they wanted. Um, so, yeah, we would do that just because of the tight turnaround. Um, when you've got more time, so with, with the World Cup qualifying campaign in 2018, I went to Belgrade to watch Serbia play Ireland and I went to Moldova to watch Moldova a double header against Serbia and, and, and Republic of Ireland. And because you've got, there's more time around that, um, there's more time to kind of bring a, a game plan together, if you like. It was more around giving the information to the an- analysis team and then them looking through it and picking up the statistical data before then presenting it to, uh, to the staff. And so how much work did you do beforehand? Obviously, you're in the group stages. You know who who you've got in those groups um, in terms of like Slovakia, England, Russia and stuff. How much work was done prior to that to know exactly what they're going to be up against in those three games? And then I guess off the back of that, like you said, it's a quick turnaround. You're not necessarily sure who you're going to be facing. Yeah, we, 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 we the Welsh are very fortunate. They've got a great analysis team headed up by Esther. Um, and they've got three or four people working uh, underneath us. So all of that, <laughs> that work was done months, months, months in advance. And, and you know, it, if there was a change of manager, does the formation change? What players were selected? What did they do? And everything, every little last detail was looked at from the analysis perspective. And they did that and that was their role. Um, you know, we were fortunate, really, if I'm being honest, we were able to go to the game. We should free us up to go to the games, write reports. Yeah, everything filtered through the analysis department and they had all of that set, you know, months in advance, really, which um, which meant, you know, game plans could be thought about. And, you know, listen, you, you put a game plan together, it might the opposition may change shape or whatever it may be, you know, so you've got to be adaptable. You might have all the information that you need and the other team may change. So, you know, all the alternatives were thought about too and it was no surprise to see Wales go as far as they did just because you know of, of the level of detail and all the work that had gone on prior and during and how hard was it for you to balance kind of doing the role in terms of you know you're there going well actually i think aaron ramsey could potentially play off this guy really well or you know what ben davis matches up against this forward really well so we can get them in one v ones he'll be fine to then go and your national team is doing essentially something historic. How difficult was that for you going into the game trying to keep? Yeah, do you know what? Yeah, no, it wasn't. My, to be fair, there was a great balance there as well because my first game out there was uh, I went to watch was uh, Wales against England. So I wasn't working that day. So I was able to go and relax, obviously, 
the last minute goal didn't really help. But um, yeah, so I was able to go across and watch and relax. So I was, I saw Wales play three times. I saw them play against England. I saw them play against uh, Northern Ireland in Paris last 16 and I saw them in the semi-final. So it was quite easy. I knew on those days, right, I'm off, right? But you know as well as I do as football people, you're still observing the game, aren't you? And you're breaking it down and things. But listen, you know, Oshan Roberts and Chris Coleman and everyone else have, you know, 10 times the knowledge I do and all we, all that, you know, it's our job to get the information to them, you know, suggest if we feel there was something. Um, and then it was up to them to come up with a game plan. So, no, it was good. That, and I think that's, again, what the Welsh have did really well. You know, the balance of you're there to work, you know, you're going to watch games probably every other day. You write a report during the day too. Now you're going to go and watch Wales. I think everyone watched Wales at least once, of all, all of our scouts that went out there, you know, and they got free tickets and were able to go and watch. So, yeah, that was really important as well because you're right, the Euro 2000, uh, World Cup 2018 qualifying campaign, I was out in Serbia and Moldova and Wales were playing at home. And usually, you know, 10 years prior, I'd probably be drinking with the boys, you know, going to watch the game. Um, so it was a slight adjustment, but understanding that, you know, the greater need of, of Wales was seeing the next opponents play and getting that information. And it was something I really enjoyed. And going back to that learning process, it was something that, you know, I attribute to, you know, my development, certainly accelerating my development a little bit because, yeah, it was something I enjoyed doing, but also I learned quite a lot from. Is there anything, like, tactically um, that you learned from other nations that surprised you or really informed your thinking moving forward? Well, yeah, when we come back to, um, you know, what we see on the field um, having a direct impact on coach education, so coming back to the, everything's integrated, you know, you've got the play pathway, you've got the coach education and, um, you know, it comes together. So I actually delivered, um, the scouts that went out there, we came back and we delivered um, presentations to the A license cohort and the pro license group as well. And the one that I delivered on was France. I went to watch um, France play Switzerland and Switzerland's rotations were exceptional and I was looking at France and what interested me was the way France's central midfielders had to come out and defend in wide areas so you know they were playing with a back four they were playing with kind of you know two holders and then four in front like a 4-2-4 four, four. so like Griezmann and Coleman but the two I think it was Pogba and Matuidi maybe I can't remember who they were now but they'd come out and have to deal with players in wide areas and obviously doing that exposes you, potentially exposes you centrally and how they were able to drop a player in and keep that, keep the two screening players in midfield, making sure they were strong on the side of the ball when the ball was wide. They were strong centrally, but they left the other side and, you know, it's a common thing and I'll be weak on the other side. And, I've, you know, the more I study it, the more difficult it is, I think, to be you know, when he's defending, strong in both wide areas and in the central of the field. So France did it really well. But yeah, the, the, and I think that's becoming more and more increasingly obvious now with the half space, for example. I'm sure a lot of people have heard about the half space, about central midfielders having to come into those half spaces and deal with players in wider areas. And, and yes, yeah, so we delivered that. I think we delivered one on Northern Ireland, Belgium. So yes, yeah, so we delivered that back to the, to, to the on the courses, Again, so everything that we learned, you know, is a sharing of knowledge and sharing of, of, of what we what we knew, really. I think the half space thing you've mentioned there is interesting. So obviously Tottenham did that quite a lot against Man City, where Hoiberg and yeah. Sissoko just went with runners, essentially. Um, and they ended up kind of in a back six. But then we were able to break because we'd left people in wider areas to exploit the space. So... I'm a Spurs fan, so yeah, it's quite... Oh, okay. cool. well, that's why I said we, I realise I've just said that. But yeah, it's, <laughs> it's quite interesting on that front. Um, is there... Like, I guess when you're going around the globe, you get to see different styles of football, different things. Is there anything that stands out to you going from region to region or team to team where you can see culturally how much it makes a difference? Or is there any similarities that you see going from place to place as well? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm an Everton fan, like I mentioned earlier, and, it, and it's interesting, Ancelotti's at Everton at this moment in time, and he talks about the spirit, he talks about the hard work, 
he talks about you know the grit of the team to win the ball and press the ball and and I think that went that I've been an Everton fan and you know my, my mother's from Liverpool and having family in Liverpool they're working class they work you know we're working class people that want to go on a Saturday and see someone put an effort in and you know any exceptional skill and anything we see is a bonus but what we want is to see effort you know and so it depends on what teams that you're at and it comes down to you know culture of the team so you know I would say Everton in terms of the culture of that team you know of the club is you know hard work um you know putting a tackle in getting in their faces you know Goodison Park on their feet and there's nothing better than that um so yeah it just depends and then as managers and coaches we need to see if there's a fit there so if anyone was ever thinking of going into a t- club what is the cultural fit you know out here it, it varies you know on, on on the on the west coast it's so hot it's difficult to keep pressing high up the field so you'll see some teams dropping off and it was interesting i it's part of my pro license i went and i spoke which was the manager at the time the global philosophy is pressing high up the field and in the summer it's so tough <laughs> because you're in and it's 90 degree heat to press high up the field and three days later the manager at the time and he loves to play the ball out the back and I hadn't mentioned what he had said to me except it's great in the summer because what we see is teams drop off us because they can't press us all the time, which means we are able to get a foothold in the game and play out from the back. So even something as simple as the weather, right, has a massive impact on the way teams play and the styles. It was interesting from literally two or three days hearing, you know, it's really tough to press. Our philosophy is to press high as, as the global. It's difficult to do that in the summer, but we still adhere to it and do it. And saying in the summer it's great <laughs> because people can't press us so we just because uh, of the heat so they can't press us as much so we play out so yeah i mean there's so many different deterring factors in america it's such a big country and which will determine you know a way a team plays and in terms of your pro license how did you find that experience i know that you know when i was at st george's park they had a course and it was interesting the people would sort of walk in past and obviously Poke, poke your head around the corner to kind of see what some of the presentations are and stuff. How was that for you and how were the study visits for you? Because I'd imagine you get to go to some real interesting places and speak to some very interesting people. Yeah, it was uh, it was, it was a privilege to be on the course. I was fortunate the course I was on had some, some great names, you know, um, and I was able to share those experiences. Um, in terms of the study visits, probably my favourite was we went over to Switzerland, went to UEFA, the UEFA headquarters, and we were able to go to Hublot, you know, Hublot the watchmaker, a um, famous, you know, watchmaker. And we were able to go and tour the facility. So from the ground floor where you had so many hundreds of people working on certain aspects. And as you went up the floors, the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The... Um, expectation and the qualifications of the people that were working there obviously went up and you'd go into a room and there'd be four people working there and there'd be no talking and they'd be literally head down on this watch for hours and it was interesting and we ended up at the top level with with a CEO and we got an opportunity to ask questions about lines of communication you know how you integrate all the workers from from all the you know the, the departments and so that was really interesting to see, you know, taking lessons from other industries is, I think it's big at this moment in time. So many people do it. So that was really interesting to do that. And then obviously go to UEFA and we, we put, a, we put a session on actually a practical session. Uh, Patrick Vieira delivered the session. I supported him and assisted him. So yeah, that was uh, his first time in Switzerland. And so that was a good um, opportunity to get out there and see. And then I also looked at uh, as part of my, um, study visit and as part of my special report I looked at effective communication you know in different industries and how that communication can improve and develop between the manager and assistant manager so I delivered on that and I found some really interesting stuff on that actually you know about how people mitigate you know so if I'm a if I'm a co-pilot I mitigate to the pilot sometimes I don't tell them hey we need to do this I might suggest and I might recommend, but I, I, because I'm from a, I don't know, a high, high-powered country, I've come up in the, I've been taught in, a, in an environment where you never 
question your elders or your seniors. And I don't know, I'm sure some of you will have seen the work that uh, Malcolm Gladwell's done in his outlier book about the, some a couple of planes that come down and he attributes it to this mitigation. And it got me thinking, that's interesting. You know, as assistant coaches, and I've been an assistant manager myself, I thought about my own practice. Do I mitigate when I speak to my coach? Do I say, could we, should we, or do I say we have to, we need to? You know, so the words and language are so, so important. And then as a coach, as a manager, what do what I want my assistant manager to be saying to me? Do I want him to be saying to me, you should, you need, or you could, you know? So again, it's that mentality and philosophy. And there was actually one person on the course, and I won't mention his name, that said, I don't want anyone demanding to me what to do. So they have to mitigate. And I'm okay, but you may concede a couple of goals because of it. High pressure environment. Something happens to, and they, they were happy with that. They would rather concede a couple of goals in the season because, you know, he's the manager and no one mitigates to him. And I thought that was an interesting thought process. And then there were some others in the room that said, no, I would rather they mitigate and we stop the goal. So again, everyone's different, of course, and the way they want to do things. And that really interests me when I dig deeper into, you know, mitigation and effective communication. And uh, I guess your work with Ian Mitchell, looking at the psychological factors of that, kind of ties into this in terms of the profiles of the people that you're working alongside. So, you know, if you've got two characters that may clash, that, you know, mitigating might not be as helpful as if you've got someone who's a bit challenging for that. So I guess for you, it's bringing all of that information and learning together. Yeah, no, definitely. And, and there was another one on the course that said that, you know, an e a chairman had emailed him and he hadn't responded to the email and the chairman had gone and done it anyway. And um, a couple of months later, it was like, oh, no, I thought you agreed with me because you didn't respond to me. I thought you agreed. In our culture, in our country, if people don't respond, we take that as an acceptance that you agree, which, again, you know, different cultures and working with different people. And these are the things that you kind of need to know when you work across the world. And these are the things that you learn when you go to different countries, which I think is really important. But, yeah, and Ian Mitchell was great. You know, he'd come in and speak to us about, you know, how to mentor, our body language, positive body language, you know, and which is also important as a coach. Um, so, yeah, I valued my time with him uh, very much too. Moving forward for you, what, what are your plans? What are your aspirations? You know, I believe in the project that we have. So Steel, Steel Sports is the overarching company, uh, and that's uh, Warren Lichtenstein owns that company. He's, uh, he's, he runs Steel Partners. Um, so, and, and we've got different sports. So we've got soccer side, which I oversee. We've got baseball and we've got softball. Um, and it's about developing players on the field, of course, but it's about developing people off the field, which, you know, is really, really important to me and the organisation too. So I'm still able to learn. I was up in Seattle last year with Jimmy Traore, who'd come through our courses. So I'm still getting exposure to the elite game, you know, and that's really important to me. Um, but I think, you know, living in America is great. I'm enjoying it out here. So as I say, <clears throat> I'm happy with, um, with the organization and, and, and the work that's getting done. I think we'll move into a, to a world-class coach development program within, within the organization. Um, but listen, I'm, I'm comfortable and happy working with coaches at this level, um, and, um, you know, developing players and, and, you know, as I said before, parents, you know, the trust they give coaches and the responsibility they give coaches to develop their children, you can't get a bigger responsibility. Coach, you know, parents can't give you a bigger responsibility than developing their kids, you know, and, and it's something we should never take for granted. And I'm privileged to be in a position to, to support and affect coaches and, and players, which is, which is what I want to do. Perfect. Listen, I've got a last question for you, which is something I ask everyone. And uh, I've got a feeling this might be a challenge for you. So apologies for putting okay. you in the spot. Which <laughs> is, um, who's the best player or coach you've worked with or against and why? Okay. <laughs> um, as, yeah. <clears throat> in terms of the best coach I've worked with, I'm going to go for my mentor, Oshan Roberts. Um, you know, he started as a football development officer on Anglesey and became the assistant manager for the Welsh FA, technical director for the Welsh FA, and obviously gone over to Morocco now and doing some great work over there. So, you know, 
I've worked closely with him. He's been had a great impact on, on my coaching style and practice. Um, and I'm not just saying it, I'm sure many, many people you will talk to have been on our courses will say, you know, he's one of, if not the best coach that they've seen work, you know, from the tactical side of the game and integrating and having the, you know, the open-mindedness to get Ian Mitchell involved and the sports science involved and integrate everything. Um, it was the first time I've seen that happen. And yeah, so I would probably say, oh, Sean. Perfect. Listen, Ian, I really, really appreciate your time and uh, it's great to have you on and hopefully you get home soon to see your family. But um, yeah, it'd be great to have you back on in another time just to catch up and see how you're getting on. No problem. Thanks for the invitation. I look forward to speaking to you soon. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Sports Initiative podcast with me, Michael Wright. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Sports Initiative podcast and share this podcast with friends and family. I'll see you next week.